Hello everyone. So it's 19th November, World COPD Day, with the theme of short of breath in COPD. Here we come with the newer guidelines, Goal 2026. Let's quickly dive into the new changes. So few things that remain same as Goal 2025 is the definition, the diagnostic spirometric threshold, that is the ratio post BD less than 0.7, emphasis on smoking cessation, pulmonary rehab, vaccination. And it still continues to recommend personalized therapy on the basis of symptom exacerbation risk and biomarkers like isnopil. Coming to the changes, so the first change is the addition of epidemiology, more of data, and uh, it is there in the first chapter under the heading of burden of COPD, which says the number of COPD cases globally is projected to increase over the coming decades and it will approach nearly 600 million COPD patients by 2050. And out of the blue, they say that increase will be greater among women and low-medium income countries because they have seen in the studies that the prevalence of smoking is comparatively increasing in women. These data has been taken mostly from this landmark paper which was published in August 2025 in Lancet. Coming to the next part, the screening and the case finding. So they have added few algorithms to make it visually look more better. So uh, here they say the barriers, why we can't identify the COPD patient earlier. So there are patient related factors, there are healthcare system related factors, there are healthcare provider related factors. So the important of all is what we can change as pulmonologists so poor understanding of COPD diagnostic criteria, inadequate training about the use of uh, spirometry and its interpretation, inadequate investigation and then referral to the respiratory specialist. Regarding healthcare system is the resource availability, then lack of training, lack of access to the quality healthcare. Among the patient related factors is patient does not recognize his symptoms because they are uh, these are usually mild then adaptation patient adapt to the activity to minimize breathlessness then uh, milder disease usually go undiagnosed this is other algorithm which says if we have a targeted individual just like same as the uh, accp criteria of lung screening so uh, if you have the targeted individual, you can directly refer them to the pulmonologist. But if you have individuals at risk, which include an age of more than equal to 35 years, exposure to various risk factors, genetic factors, prematurity, or has respiratory symptoms, patient undergo a screening questionnaires. These are available in the gold guidelines and can be seen on Google also. If the questionnaire result out to be positive, Either you can refer the patient to the primary care setting or a specialist. If you are sending uh, the patient to specialist, patient will undergo a, a basic spirometry and if COPD is confirmed, he'll get a post bronchodilator spirometry and the management. In the primary setting, there are uh, devices like PAFR and if these are positive, again you can refer to pulmonologist or you can just uh, monitor a symptom and risk factor if the screening questionnaire is negative or if the PFR is normal. Then there is uh, more information regarding the type of vaccine uh, for influenza, pneumococcal and RSV. So here for the influenza vaccine, uh, recently a paper got published by Pfizer. So high dose inactivated HD2V3 and adjuvant inactivated A2V3, these vaccines are acceptable as influenza vaccination in older adults. For pneumonia, of course, we still have PPSV23 and PCV13, but soon uh, we'll have PCV20, PCV15 and PCV21. So the gold recommend the use of PCV20 or 21 whenever they are available. For RSV, the vaccine which is recommended is a uh, bivalent perfusion F protein based vaccine or adjuvant perfusion F protein based vaccine or mRNA RSV based vaccine.
for all the patient who are more than 50 for more than 75 again recommended if not taken earlier in between if they have some risk factor like chronic heart disease chronic lung disease they are immunocompromised they are living in a nursing home or some long-term care facility then the various studies which has been done recently they all show the patient have a low adverse drug reaction they have decreased chances of rsv associated uh, disease and exacerbation coming to the treatment part so the most important change which has been done is in this part is the addition of this moderate exacerbation earlier it was just severe exacerbation now they have added moderate exacerbation so basically now the greater emphasis is on proactive escalation so we are uh, earlier considering combination inhaled therapy or add on anti-inflammatory options even when symptoms are modest so this shift in the management is basically preventing the first moderate exacerbation so now we don't have to prevent the recurrence we also have to prevent the first moderate exacerbation this might increase the early use of dual or triple therapy or targeted ai uh, anti-inflammatory therapy but then you have to balance against uh, side effects so the cost the availability everything has to be taken care of then the next change is both of these diagrams they were there in the previous guidelines but now they categorize it as initial pharmacological treatment and follow-up therapy for the patients who are already on medication and the exacerbation is being defined as mild moderate severe this was there in previous guideline also which is based on the room criteria here we have crp which is the major lab parameter which can differentiate between mild and moderate for severe of course there will be abg changes there will be hypercapnia acidosis coming to the next part is the addition of a word called disease activity so assessing disease activity and its modulation by intervention generally requires the monitoring of biomarkers but these biomarkers are still to be validated and we need to identify more biomarkers so the basic thing which can act as a measurable indicators of the disease activity is clinical features like exacerbation chronic worsening of symptoms disease progression in the term of uh, lung function decline all these can be used as valid measurable indicators so low disease activity which is the new motto new motto of the copd management is to reduce the disease activity so the patient is having no exacerbation no worsening of symptoms and there is no pft decline so these two terminologies are now there disease stability and disease control disease stability says uh, a low disease activity with no exacerbation no worsening of symptoms no accelerated loss of lung function as we discussed disease control means no symptoms no exacerbation plus there is low impact on the patient defined as symptoms below a threshold value so pft criteria does not doesn't come in disease control then we come to uh, this uh, data uh, which is uh, on the clinical trials which has been done on the immunotherapy in copd patient so already in 2025 they begin the non traditional therapies like dupilumab added to some of the figures and they mentioned about biological data but now the 2026 they codifies the evidence into a dedicated figure this figure and it reflects the growing tri uh, trial data for biologics in selected copd phenotypes like whether it is type 2 inflammation high snow fields or recurrent exacerbation so this is a good table to clinically identify the candidates uh, who are a good candidate for a referral to pulmonologist or special centers and also sets expectation for payers and regulators coming to this part so multimorbidity chapter has been fully written rewritten sorry with updated guidance and the new figures linking copd care they have been added 
So coming to this first figure, which shows you 4M, mentation related to patient's anxiety, depression, cognitive impairment, mobility, where we have to check for the balance and the exercise capacity. Comorbidities, just check and address them. And the medication, always review and if necessary, either you can uh, adjust the dose or de-prescribe whatever is appropriate for the patient. Then they, uh, this is kind of a phenotyping or making clusters on the basis of the comorbidities or the main uh, symptoms which are associated with COPD. So there is a mental cluster associated with COPD associated with more of CNS symptoms like depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment. Then we have a respiratory cluster where the patient have COPD uh, symptoms along with lung cancer, asthma, some sleep related breathing disorders, ILD and bronchitis. Then cardiovascular cluster, comorbidities like hypertension, 4P, arrhythmias, heart failures, metabolic diseases like diabetes, fatty liver, obesity, GERD. And there is a new term that is multiple organ loss of issue. So this phenotype uh, basically highlights COPD as a multi-organ disease. And here we need to assess the nutritional status, muscle mass, sarcopenia, osteoporosis and anemia. So basically systemic inflammation, rehabilitation, anabolic strategies. So this MALT is a new phenotype of COPD. More data has been given for this phenotype. And it says basically this subgroup is characterized by not only the involvement of the lung tissue, but also systemic loss of tissue. So there is low muscle mass, low BMI, bone loss, because both of them have a similar pathological mechanism that is systemic inflammation, catabolism, protease, anti-protease imbalance. And this phenotype have higher mortality, worse exercise capacity and poor health status. Then coming to this diagram, uh, it is basically they have given a complementary approach for the detection of frequent morbidities in all COPD patient. What all tests you have to do to check these comorbidities in a COPD patient. So for this anxiety depression, they have given this various scoring system. So you can have generalized anxiety disorder, this and then mini mental state examination. And then there is a patient healthcare questionnaire. For lung related, you have MMRC, CAT, sleep. For sleep, you have ESS and stop bang. For metabolic, you have LFT, HbA1c, GFR, CBC, DLC. For MOLT, you have 6 minute walk distance, SARC F, DEXA scan. For cardiac, you have ECG, NTPRO, BNP. And rest are the simply COPD basic tests. Now here is a brand new chapter which discusses AI, the diagnostic and the phenotyping tools, the telehealth, remote monitoring, imaging biomarkers, multimodal predictive models, algorithm bias, data privacy, lack of standardization, need of regulatory oversight and ensuring equitable access before widespread adoption. So this is something really new which has been added into the goal 2026. So I know this slide is very busy, but you can just have a look at the bold headings. So they have discussed AI enhanced diagnostics. They have also discussed about AI in spirometric quality and interpretation. Then imaging based AI biomarkers. And then predictive analytics for uh, predicting exacerbation, digital phenotyping, remote monitoring technologies, smart inhalers of course, telehealth and virtual COPD management, clinical decision support system CDSS and some caution related to overuse of AI, its uh, ethics, equity, validation and everything. So this is one of the slides you can go through which basically compare the goal 2025 and the draft of goal 2026. So everything has been discussed here. 
so summarizing uh, some practical takeaways for all the pulmonologist so be more proactive about exacerbation now we might have to change the gold a b and e if the patient even have a moderate exacerbation so even one moderate exacerbation should push us to consider stepping up therapy or closer follow up check for the vaccination policies then they have clarified the initial versus follow up algorithms then phenotyping biomarkers although they were there but now 2026 they have basically made it more visual and it is gradually becoming more important watch for the ai tools but still be cautious and seek validated tools so thank you everyone please like the video if you found the content knowledgeable and subscribe for further more updates thank you